Are you sure you don't want to give it a minute? Because mm -hmm. I like even numbers. <laughs> You are the host. Awesome. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. I do actually, hold on. I need to end this share really quick. I forgot to hit a button. Yeah, you did. There we go. I had to make sure sound was shared as well. Okay, cool. Um, so this class, if, if you guys have taken this class before, this is really similar to the other classes that I've taught. This is Nature's Bounty. It's a presentation on wild edible fruits and vegetables. This one's gonna be focused more on culinary stuff and uh, more on the edible side of things than on the medicinal side of things. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start off with just a few notes on sustainability. Foraging wild plants inherently has an environmental impact due to the removal of a natural element of the ecosystem. When you're taking something out of the ecosystem, we inherently have some sort of impact. There's a few steps, however, that we can take to mitigate that impact and ensure that future generations can be passed the knowledge of, I said wild medicine, because I copied this slide from my medicinal slide. It should say wild foods. <laughs> uh, some herbs that are gonna be covered in this class, such as burdock, <clears throat> are highly invasive, noxious weeds. Removing these from the local environment allows native plants to better compete for resources. So you can actually find uh, your state's uh, noxious weed list. Uh, it's quick Google. Um, Colorado divides ours into a number of tiers um, based off of how invasive they are and how dangerous to the environment that they are. You wanna be mindful of your environment. If you only see one milkweed growing along a trail, encourage that milkweed to prosper rather than foraging it. So that okay. next season, your harvest will be more fruitful. And you never want to harvest more of a plant than is needed for the plant to survive when possible. So, you know, for example, wild onion, um, <clears throat> the any of our root vegetables and stuff, you, you're not going to be able to let the plant survive after you remove the root system. But, uh, for example, like catnip, um, you know, any kind of herbs, fruits and stuff, there's no need to pull the entire plant. Just pinch off what you need. Uh, for what you're trying to do. And then um, it, an important thing here is that if the natural and biodiverse areas where you forage are threatened by encroachment, you should get involved. Um, part of stewardship of the land and part of you know, utilizing the land as a natural resource is getting involved when those resources are threatened. If you're taking from the land, you should be also protecting it. <clears throat> I talk a little bit about um, uh, nutrient density and oxalic acid and things like that in this class. This isn't as much as my medicinal class, but it's still worth noting, I am not a medical professional. I do not hold any degree in medicine from any accredited institution. The medical advice offered in this class, while oftentimes having been used in folk remedies for centuries, should never be held to a higher standard than what's given to you by your doctor. Many of the remedies discussed in this class have incredible amounts of research by accredited institutions to back them up. However, that is not a replacement for FDA approval and regulation. If you have access to professional medical help, always consult your physician before engaging in any form of regular herbal regimen, especially if you are taking any kind of prescription medications so that drug interaction can be taken into consideration. Taking an interest in your own health and well being is one of the best reasons to delve into herbalism and foraging. Uh, but don't let it be a detriment to your health. It defeats the purpose entirely. So I get asked this question a lot, where can I forage? Pretty much anywhere. However, you need to be aware of the regulations 
in your local area. If you're foraging on a park or a trail, make sure you check the regulations with the appropriate governmental body beforehand, excuse me, and understand any at-risk plants in the area to avoid or any permits that must be acquired. Um, if you're on Bureau of Land Management land or national park land, uh, you can actually go to those uh, respective government agency websites and um, you can get a forest products permit. It's about $20. Um, for each of those types of land. And uh, that is your best bet for legally foraging on public land. If you're foraging on private land, just make sure that you have permission from the landowner. Uh, you don't want someone coming after you or you know some crazy landowner coming at you with like a, you know, get off my land kind of thing. Uh, uh, so I have a question. Yes. So uh, these permits are specifically for and designated to the areas that we're foraging, but is there any restrictions on the total amount of gathering that we are on a specific supplement or plant? So it's, um, those are per there's, there's two types of permits for federal land. One is for personal use and one is for commercial use. And uh, as far as I'm aware, the personal use is just, um, like if you're gathering a ton of stuff and then selling it at the local farmer's market, uh, you get slapped with a bunch of fines. You'd need a commercial license for that. But if you're gathering for personal use, I don't think that there's any um, uh, official regulation on what that uh, constitutes. And so like you can collect things and then freeze them for later. Um, but uh, you, you still, you don't wanna over forage an area in general. So I just kind of be mindful. The person who's designated to only uh, your own use or can I just share with my, own, my friends? Yeah, you can share with your friends. Um, that, that's, oh, okay. the, yeah, that's, it's, it's more like if you're making money off of it. Like if you're making a commercial enterprise or a business out of going and collecting morel mushrooms, yeah. then you need a commercial like, permit to do that. Okay, yeah. so everything that I learned from these classes or any uh, information that I gather from you, I'm, I'm, okay to basically spread the love to anyone who's oh yeah absolutely please do please do okay thank you yeah, please do um for sure uh and uh if you're foraging in an urban environment like um you know local parks and stuff like that uh be mindful of chemicals such as pesticides herbicides and other pollutants that contain your harvest especially with things like uh you know we're gonna get into a lot of common weeds like dandelions um a lot of people spray herbicide on those and uh, you don't want to consume those poisons. Uh, so not only wash your stuff really well, but just try to be mindful of what's being sprayed around. And if you are foraging in an urban environment, um, then uh, like abandoned lots are your best bet because nobody is really taking care of those. They're overgrown. There's usually a lot of biodiverse stuff in there, um, you know, purslane, curly dock, things like that. Um, and, and just, I would stay away from any place that looks like it's been heavily maintained and, uh, and like groomed to avoid poison. Speaking of poison, should I worry about poisonous plants? Yeah, absolutely. You should absolutely be mindful at all times of common poisonous plants in your area. And don't harvest any plant that you can't accurately identify. If you're, if you can't, if you're not a hundred percent sure as to what something is, you shouldn't harvest it because you could pick some kind of poisonous lookalike. Some herbs have poisonous lookalikes and that has to be taken into consideration in your foraging. Um, all of the, all the stuff that I teach in here, most of these do not have poisonous lookalikes. There's a couple that do and I cover that. Um, specifically wild onion, it looks very similar to death camas. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll go into some of that, but here's some, um, some just oh, real do, common. Do you have like visual aids or, or any pictures so I can, I. Yeah, so I yeah, get... absolutely. Absolutely. Right, there cool. could be lots right. of pictures. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Um, yeah, so here's some, here's some common poisonous plants right here. Poison sumac, poison oak, and poison ivy. One thing that you'll notice about these plants, these are all uh, what's called contact dermatitis poisons. Um, if, you, if you rub up on these plants, you'll get a big rash on you. And you can see um, how shiny these leaves are. That's because there's an oil 
uh, that's that's on the surface of these leaves, and that is what aggravates the skin. A lot of contact dermatitis poison plants, like poison sumac, oak, or ivy, are going to have these shiny, shiny leaves. And um, anytime you see any kind of plant with like really shiny leaves like that, that is because there's either some sort of oil or some sort of wax on the surface of the leaf. And plants don't usually just do that for no reason. Yes, they might have a waxy surface on an evergreen leaf like Pipsisua um, that uh, is to protect against the environment. But a lot of times it's some sort of oil that's protecting it from being eaten or being collected. So moving on, what do I need to get started? Well, you can just go outside today and get started. There's a few tools that make foraging much easier. A cloth uh, sack. I, yeah. Uh, Touching base back to uh, um, all the different like uh, poisonous plants or things that might be irritating or anything, but would they still be useful if, if collected? Um, yeah, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about stinging nettle. Um, which is a plant that causes contact dermatitis. It has these trichomes on its surface that are like little hairs that sting you, um, but they can be processed out. Um, as far as like any kind of medicinal uses for poison sumac or like poison ivy, I'm, I'm not really aware of any um, outside of like, I know that some people rub stinging nettle on their skin purposefully to get the rash to increase blood flow but I don't, I, I'm not super familiar with it. Uh, so a cloth sack or basket to keep your harvest in. I recommend a basket or a cloth sack as opposed to like uh, plastic, um, like either plastic bags or uh, Tupperware containers because um, a lot of plants, you know, after you pick them, they're gonna start sweating a lot of the uh, uh, moisture in them out and uh, they will soil and wilt really quickly um, if they're in a plastic bag for a long period of time. You, you, you wanna have some airflow in there. A uh, small knife or a pair of gardening shears to cleanly trim plants. A pair of gardening gloves to avoid stickers or thorns. And some thread to tie together bundles of herbs. You can see they, they tie together some of these spruce uh, boughs here with a uh, um, with a string. This is this is uh, a useful tool that a lot of people forget to bring along, and it helps keep your harvest separated too. Um, so that when you get home, you're not emptying your basket out, and there's like just a pile of lots of different plants. You keep your things nice and separated with some thread. Uh, a small trowel for roots, a little little shovel, and your trusty local plant identification guide. Here's some of my favorite guides. Uh, these are the ones that I usually carry with me. Uh, the Complete Guide to Edible Wild Plants, Mushrooms, Fruits, and Nuts, Finding, Identifying, and Cooking by Katie Letcher Lyle. Uh, this is a classic guide that covers a lot of North America, and it's got a whole lot of really good information and really good uh, um, illustrations and pictures in it as well to help to identify, as well as some dichotomous keys. Uh, same with Edible and Medicinal Plants of the West by Gregory L. Tilford. Um, this is, in my opinion, the most indispensable guide for medicinal plants in um, Western North America. Uh, they, I think that Gregory L. Tilford also has one um, <clears throat> for like the Appalachian region and the East Coast. But since I forage in Colorado, um, I use, you know, of course, my local guide. Uh, and then the Peterson Field Guide to Plants and Herbs. This one is the Eastern and Central North America. Peterson Field Guides are some of the best field guides out there for identifying. Um, and there's lots of different Peterson Field Guides. There's bird guides, there's, you know, insect identification guides, fossil identification guides. Um, Peterson's uh, entire line of guides is one of the mainstays in, in field identification. There's also um, an app that I use called Picture This, which uses uh, AI to um, identify plants. Uh, I've, I've found that it's, um, it's pretty accurate, but it shouldn't be used as uh, like an end all be all, and it should, like the best use you could get out of that is to confirm identification on something. So if you're like, I'm, 
99% sure that this is curly doc. And so you check it in picture this, picture this comes back and says, yes, it's curly doc. But if you're using it just to identify like every plant that you come across, um, it's not accurate enough for that, unfortunately. So we're gonna get into uh, some of our plants, common weeds. Um, these are things that you could just find um, pretty much anywhere, uh, no matter where you are. So we're gonna start off with dandelion. Yeah, me and my girlfriend forage uh, dandelions in on unmaintenance areas, and we're trying to utilize this uh, that plant and her passion for it, and also just my passion and and trying to, uh, I guess, just like make medicines and basic teas and things like that. So uh, for sure, I think for it's, sure. it's so awesome, bro. Thank you. Yeah, uh, all parts of the dandelion plant are edible, um, so the whole plant is edible. It's highly nutrient dense. It's very tasty when prepared correctly and it has numerous medicinal benefits as well. And it's beneficial to other plants. So on dandelion's nutrient density, it's high in calcium. Half a cup of dandelion greens contains more calcium than a glass of milk. Vitamin C, one cup of dandelion greens contains 19 milligrams of vitamin C. Vitamin K, Half a cup of dandelion greens contains more vitamin K than two carrots. That's the, the thing in carrots that's good for eye health. Um, and vitamin A, 55 milligrams of dandelion greens contains 535% of your daily value of vitamin A. It also contains a variety of other essential mineral, minerals such as folic acid, magnesium, and potassium. How and when to harvest dandelion. So if you're harvesting the root, it's best picked in spring before the flower shoot is sprouted while it's still just kind of like a disc of leaves. But you can harvest the root kind of whenever. Um, the leaves, the young tender leaves are the most palatable. Always pick the smallest, newest leaves. They're gonna to be towards the stem. So like towards the center of the plant is where the, the newest leaves are gonna be popping out of. They're best tasting in spring. And the flower head, you can pick at any time, but it should be harvested when it's fully bloomed. So when there's not a whole lot of like green on it and it's, it's, it's fully opened up, but before it goes to seed. So you don't, you know, you're not gonna eat the, the, the puffy um, like uh, uh, seed ball that you, you blow on to make a wish. Um, that, that part is, is, while it's edible, it's not very tasty. And then again, chemical and danger. Also, it, it's purposeful just for like a, the, seed, the seed reason, right? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, while dandelions aren't known to absorb any chemicals from the soil, they are sprayed often with weed killer, which can be toxic and will strongly affect the taste. <clears throat> so here's our first little recipe here, dandelion greens with garlic. Um, this is just a sauteed dandelion green, um, uh, and you want to boil the greens first though. So you boil the greens in salted water until they're tender, and then you want to cook them, you want to fry them in a bunch of oil. And the reason you want to uh, boil them first and then fry them in a bunch of oil is because uh, dandelion greens on their own can be really bitter. And this is gonna remove that bitter taste uh, and, and, and mask it a lot. Um, boiling the greens beforehand gets out a lot of the lacticarium that's in the leaves, the, the white sap that's very bitter. And then um, when you uh, fry it in a bunch of oil, what that does is it dissipates a lot of that bitter oils that are in the dandelion out. And so it, it's spread across the entire dish rather than just inside of the leaves. Um, and uh, that makes it a lot more palatable. This recipe uses vegetable oil. I really like to make this same recipe with um, uh, bacon fat. Bacon fat's my favorite thing to cook dandelion greens with. Uh, Cajun dandelion flour recipe. Also for anybody that is here from, not from divination, um, Dan like you, Daniel like you and, and Tav, uh, if you if you want um, a copy of this, uh, um, please, I would yeah. love it. 
I'll send it over to you. I'll, I'll shoot you in a DM. Um, Alex will have that have it for people who are in um, divination. Uh, <clears throat> so here's a Cajun dandelion flower recipe. Um, this is one of my favorite ways to cook dandelion flower heads. You just bread them in some Cajun seasoning and deep fry them, and they're like little uh, um, plant chicken nuggets. <laughs> There, there. It's a, it's a really good snack, and it's a great trail snack too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, the chat. I have to get the chat open over here. Why am I not seeing it? Hmm. Hold on one second. I'm trying to get the. I'm trying to open the chat. There we go. So I can see what people are saying here. All the recipes are on the website. Cool. That's uh, that's from from Alex from Divination. Do so. Next is dandelion root coffee. Um, this is a coffee alternative similar to chicory that you can make with dandelion root. You're just gonna cut up your dandelion root, trim off the little bits, uh, and just keep the the tap root, the long root, and um, roast it in the oven, 350 degrees for 40 minutes. And then you can brew, uh, I mean, it's a decoction. So uh, tea is an infusion, coffee is a decoction. Um, it's, it's a strong infusion basically. And, and it tastes very similar to coffee, but without the bite. Um, it doesn't contain any caffeine. However, what it does contain, excuse me, uh, what it does contain is chicoric acid, um, which will uh, help to help you to lose weight if you're trying to lose weight. What it does is it inhibits the hormones that trigger the body to store excess carbohydrates as lipids. Um, so uh, when you, as a, as a human being, when you eat an excess of carbohydrates, um, your body, because it's a, it's a survival mechanism, it says, hey, I need to, I need to store uh, this energy for later because there might be a drought or I don't know when the next time I'm gonna see food again is, um, as just an evolutionary trigger, your body then releases hormones which store those carbohydrates as fats. Um, and chicoric acid, which is found in dandelion root, will inhibit those uh, hormones from acting. And then dandelion wine. This is like everybody's favorite thing to do with dandelions. And it's really tasty, it's really good. It takes six months. It takes a very long time and I'm not going to go into all the steps here because there's a lot of steps here. Again, I'll provide you guys with this, um, but you can make a wine out of dandelions and uh, it is a delicacy in a lot of parts of the US. I know where I grew up in Montana, a lot of people made dandelion wine. Uh, we called it Hooterite wine um, and uh, it's, it's tasty. It's a good summer treat. So the environmental benefits of dandelion. Dandelion roots aerate the soil and prevent erosion. If left to die back on their own, dandelions return a high number of vitamins, minerals, and nitrogen into the soil, helping plants to grow and, and helping to complete the nitrogen cycle of the soil. Oh, and we're off to our next plant. Uh, any questions about dandelions? Cool. Can I make a, a dandelion uh, crown? Yes, yes, you can. <laughs> I, I will be pestering you for some more recipes later, if that's okay. Not a problem, not a problem. Uh, so the next plant is purslane. This is one of those cracks in the sidewalk plants. It's one of the most common wild edibles. It's a great addition to salads. It tastes kind of lemony and peppery, um, and it is a superfood. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, uh, from Alex here in the chat. Uh, if you would like access to the website, um, you must enroll in the academy. If okay. you would like to enroll in the academy, then you can message uh, the page that you found this event on, or if you know me, uh, Dorian, you could ask me, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll message you guys the um, the link to the Divination Academy. They do a lot of really cool classes. A lot yeah, of really thank cool you so much. Classes. Yeah, for sure. But also, uh, the plant that you're showing, this uh, pers purslane, mm -hmm. my my aunties from Mexico, they they use it to cook, and they found it on our our driveway one day. And then the 100 percent gonna show a Mexican recipe in, <laughs> in a second. Dude, yeah, I, it's, it's used I a lot. I was so second guessing because they pulled it off the driveway, but they were oh, no, it, it actually tastes good. Yeah. Very good. And it's a superfood. 
Uh, purslane has higher concentrations of essential vitamins and minerals than many common superfoods such as kale or spinach. It's got iron, vitamin C, vitamin A, calcium, and phosphorus. It's also an excellent source of omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids uh, are something that is essential for uh, the heart, um, but it's not something that humans synthesize in their own body. We have to consume it from some other source. Usually fish is the, um, is the thing that people uh, uh, get omega-3 fatty acids from, but purslane actually contains more omega-3 fatty acids per cup than salmon. Uh, it lowers blood pressure, reduces triglycerides, slows the development of plaque in the heart in the arteries, reduces the chance of abnormal heart rhythm, reduces the likelihood of heart attack and stroke, and it lessens the chance of sudden cardiac death in people with heart disease. Uh, I have heart problems. This is really good to know. Purslane's a really good uh, food for that. It's it's got a lot of those omega three fatty acids in it. Um, it, it gives you the same kind of benefits as eating uh, um, uh, salmon, but uh, you know it's vegan. It's uh, right. you can salmon it can be rough diet. when you don't feel good because it's fishy. Yep, yep, yep. So here's a recipe from a website called Mexico in My Kitchen, and uh, purslane is is used in a lot of uh, um, local Mexican cuisines as a foraged food. Um, you just two cups of purslane, a clove of garlic, and some olive oil. Steam the purslane. It's got a great taste to it already. It doesn't need a whole lot of spices to it. Top it with some cotija cheese. And uh, it's, it's a great dish. Maybe throw some lime on there. Um, this is one of my favorite side dishes. And it tastes, uh, it's got kind of a zest to it. It's very- um, Well, maybe you should invite people over for uh, dinner more often. Yeah, yeah. I was kidding, but yeah, it, it <laughs> seems like uh, me and my girlfriend have fun with this. For sure. Lamb's quarters is the next plant we're going to talk about. It's also known as wild spinach, but it's actually a type of quinoa. Um, it's a tasty addition to sautés, omelets, pastas, same juice as quinoa. Um, it is found everywhere because um, as people spread throughout the world, um, in Paleolithic times, they purposefully spread its seeds everywhere they went. And so wherever humans are, lamb's quarters can pretty much be found. It's highly nutrient dense and it does contain oxalic acid. So it should not be consumed daily. We're gonna talk about oxalic acid in just a second. A little warning about oxalic acid. So many foods such as legumes, quinoa, cocoa, kale, rhubarb, and spinach contain oxalic acid. Oxalic acid binds to phosphorus and calcium, making those, uh, um, making those minerals unable to be used by the body. And high amounts of oxalic acid-rich foods have been linked to kidney stone formation. Um, it, it binds to phosphorus and calcium in the body, and then you can get these calcium growths in your kidneys, kidney stones, that you, you don't want a kidney stone. Um, so you, you shouldn't eat any food with oxalic acid daily. Um, and this is my little, my little quick warning about that. Uh, young purslane leaves, or not purslane, sorry, this should, say, um, this should say lamb's quarters. Young lamb's quarters leaves contain much lower amounts of oxalic acid. So you should always harvest the youngest, most tender leaves. And here is a quick recipe on a lamb's quarters soup. Uh, with some turkey or pheasant or chicken wings in it um, and chicken broth. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a nice little soup. Um, it's, you know, kind of a, a, a hearty um, fall soup. It's a nice way to use lamb's quarters. Uh, lamb's quarters can be, found, can be collected pretty much throughout the year, um, except in wintertime. And so it's a great green to add to different kinds of stocks. Um, you could saute it as well. You could throw it in a stir fry. It tastes a lot like spinach and it has a very similar texture. <clears throat> so the next one we're gonna talk about is broadleaf plantain. Uh, it is not related to the cousin of the banana. It is not that kind of plantain. They just have the same name, but it is also called white man's footprint as it was spread across North America unintentionally by European colonizers. 
um, anywhere where white people were walking around, there would be purslane popping up. And it ended up becoming uh, part of the Native American diet uh, post-colonization. Um, one of the most prolific invasive weeds, it originated in Asia, but now it's found in every continent. The leaves have numerous medicinal properties, and the leaves and the shoots are nutrient dense and taste you when cooked or raw. Some people do have a rare contact dermatitis allergy to the leaves. So you wanna test them. Um, and really the only way to test them is rub it on your arm and see if you get a rash. Very rarely people do have a contact dermatitis allergy to it, but it is, um, you wanna, you'd rather have a rash on your arm than in your throat by eating it without testing it first. And you know, you test it one time and hey, I don't have this allergy, you're good for the, you, you don't have to test like every leaf. So and how do you use broadleaf plantain? Sorry, what was that? That is good to know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the young shoots are comparable to asparagus or fiddleheads and they are a healthy nutrient dense vegetable. The younger tender leaves can be added to salads as both a leafy green and for their medicinal benefits. They have, they, uh, we talk a lot about broadleaf plantains medicinal benefits in my medicinal herbs class that I, I teach every other week. Um, the older shoots and leaves become very fibrous and woody and difficult to eat, um, but the older leaves can still be added to stews and used as a tea. So here's some cheesy plantain chips. Um, this is a, a good way to use uh, broadleaf plantain and it's, they're kind of like kale chips. Um, you know, it's a really low carb uh, way to have nachos. Um, you could just, I mean, you just uh, uh, cook them in the oven with some shredded cheese and throw some, uh, um, you throw some herbs on there. Uh, this has like some cilantro on it. Um, <clears throat> maybe a little bit of lemon or lime, very tasty. And this is one of my, I, I, I'll, I'll be showing a few YouTube videos uh, throughout this as well, um, just because I think it's nice to have the visual of uh, somebody cooking something. So here's a quick little video on sauteed plantain shoots by Wilderstead. There we have some delicious flowering shoots from the broadleaf plantain. I the highly idea recommend of foraging food generally conjures up know, ideas in people's heads of roaming around in the forest looking for mushrooms and various berries and things like that. However, that does not need to be the case. You can probably walk out into your front or backyard and find some pretty useful plants. Let's have a look at broadleaf plantain. Here we have a decent sized patch of broadleaf plantain large oval shaped leaves. The veins run from the base of the stem up to the edges of the leaf. Most people know this plant as a medicinal plant. It's useful for treating bug bites, burns, rashes, zits, things like that. However, you can eat the whole plant the leaves when they're this old are quite fibrous. They're not really, not really that good. Smaller, more tender leaves are what you would want to eat. But what I want to focus on are the flowering shoots. These are very, very tasty. You could almost look at them as tasting like something between a fiddlehead and an asparagus. They go through stages and you're best off to harvest the small, tender shoots of the plant. As they begin to mature and put out seeds, they become somewhat bitter and quite, quite tough. So we here tend to avoid these ones that are throwing out seeds. So let's put our focus on these smaller, new, tender shoots that will just pop off very easily, just like that. Broadleaf plantain grows in such dense, 
population that it really does not take long at all to harvest enough of these to make either a full meal or just a side dish. Just kind of move around through the patches that you find. And when you pick these shoots, they will also start to throw off new shoots because the plant wants to flower, it wants to reproduce, create seed. Native North Americans referred to this plant as white man's feet because everywhere we went, this plant would eventually show up because of how quickly it spreads. And even the toughest growing conditions, this is all clay, sand, rock, not the most ideal conditions for most plants. And you can see a lot of these plants are quite far along. We have been harvesting these regularly. It's quite easy to tell which ones are tender enough to eat. You can see I'm putting a lot of pressure on these and they're just not breaking. However, these couple right here, they'll just pop right off just like that very very easily. Cooking up the flowering shoots of the plantain is really quite simple. So we have a small amount of plantain shoots. Some chopped garlic, some salt, some pepper and a, just a tiny drop of olive oil. We're gonna cook it up on the fire in a little cast iron pan. Start with the garlic, salt, pepper, oil mixture. And once that starts to bubble a little bit, put the plantain in. You can eat these raw. I just find a quick little pan fry with some garlic and salt and pepper really helps to bring out the flavor. Again, they're kind of like a combination in flavor of fiddleheads from the ostrich fern and your regular asparagus. Very tasty. And just a couple minutes on the fire. There we have some delicious flowering shoots from the broadleaf plantain. Mm. Love these things. They're so good for you too. Delicious. So that's just one of the many plants that you can probably find in your front or backyard. You don't have to be roaming around in the middle of nowhere, out in the wilderness, to forage tasty, healthy foods. There. So yeah, it's broadleaf plantain. It's a good one. Uh, so it's delightful. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he, he's he's the nicest Canadian man in the world. Uh, highly recommend follow Wilderstead. Um, Curly Doc is uh, the next plant we're going to talk about. This is uh, one of my personal favorites, uh, especially this time of year. Um, but it goes through a number of stages. And so you can, um, you can harvest different parts of this plant at different points throughout the year. 
So many species of dock grow in the US, but curly dock is the unifier. It grows everywhere from deserts to suburbs. It's all over the place. The young leaves have a tangy lemony flavor that is a prized green for foragers. The seeds can be used as a cereal, similar to buckwheat. And the shoot is a vers versatile vegetable that can be eaten raw, steamed, or sauteed. And the root has numerous medicinal values. So here's the life cycle of curly dock. Um, when it first starts to grow in the springtime, it is this big disc of uh, these broad leaves uh, that, that come up. These ones towards the center, um, that uh, they'll, they'll be really curly and really tender. Those are the best ones. They start to get kind of bitter as they get bigger. The big ones on the outside, you don't really wanna use those just because it's not gonna be very tasty. The tender middle ones here are the ones that you want for that tangy, lemony flavor that they have. Uh, then the plant starts to send up shoots. These are the shoots here, these stems. Um, and they get these tiny little yellow flowers on the top of them. Uh, again, these shoots are edible as well. You can, you can cut them to, uh, you know, I cut them to like two inch segments and just uh, fry them, I throw, add them to, to sautés, add them to stir fries and stuff. Uh, they're kind of similar to an asparagus. And then as the um, flowers mature and the shoots mature, they get this reddish grain um, that, that uh, forms on the flower heads. And uh, this grain is, can be used as a cereal, um, as like a, a similar to how you might use buckwheat or quinoa. <clears throat> so how to use curly dock? Uh, the curly dock greens are very tasty. They have a lemony tang to them. They must be eaten when they're young. The youngest leaves should be gathered as the older leaves will take on a very bitter taste. The leaves can be taste tested raw for palatability. So if you're unsure, uh, you know, like, hey, is the, are these leaves young and tender enough? Are they gonna have that, that nice taste to them? You could just eat these raw. Um, and you could also add these to salads and some nice addition to salads. The stem of the curly dock can be peeled and eaten either raw, steamed or sauteed, but it should also be gathered young before it goes to seed, um, before those red seeds start to appear on them. The older the stem, the woodier it gets and the less palatable it'll be. When they get woody, you can boil them for a little while to make them um, more tender, uh, but it's just, um, it's just easier to, to just pick them when they're younger. You have to process them a lot less. And then the seeds of curly dock are similar to buckwheat and they can be ground into a flour or a cereal. Uh, so here is a Mediterranean dock soup with rice. Uh, this is a, really uses that tangy flavor um, with some chicken stock and some fresh lemon juice. It's got some cumin in it. This is a, uh, this is like a Tunisian recipe. It's really, really tasty. And then using the seeds here, you can make some curly dock crackers with the seeds. And this is very easy to do. You just add flour and the ground seeds together. Um, you can even grind the seeds into flour if you wanted to and just use that if you can get a whole cup of flour out of it. Uh, in a bowl, you're just gonna mix them together with some salt, add water till it's a dough, and then roll it really flat, cut it into some shapes and put it in the oven. Um, you know, you could add other things to this. You could add some dried berries, um, some sugar to make it a little bit more uh, tasty. But just as a cracker like this, I mean, this is great with some cheese on it. Great dipped into some oil and vinegar. So that was our common weeds that grow pretty much everywhere. Now we're going to get into wild herbs and vegetables. First one is catnip. This grows all over the place in shady wooded areas. Um, it is mildly sedating as a tea. It's very aromatic and it can be given to cats. Um, and here's a little recipe for homemade cat treats with wild catnip. Um, this is just, you know, tuna, coconut flour and olive oil and catnip with some egg uh, to bind it all together. Make it into a dough roll them into little croutons and put it on a baking sheet. 
bake it for about 15 minutes. Um, cats love this. Next herb is bee balm. It is these really showy purple flowers here. Uh, the leaves and the flowers can be used as an oregano substitute. Um, it tastes just like oregano, or it can be added to salads. Uh, bee balm also has a long history uh, as a medicinal herb with a variety of uses. We talk about bee balm a lot within my medicinals class. Um, I really love adding these flowers to pastas um, just as a bright color pop to a dish and for that oregano taste and, uh, and um, uh, scent. They also make bee balm cookies. So here's a little recipe on bee balm cookies with some orange zest um, using the chopped bee balm flowers. Very cute little cottage core cookie. Next, we're gonna talk about spruce tips. Um, so this is an often overlooked and very nice edible. I really enjoy spruce tips. The tender fresh tips of spruce trees are a useful spice with a citrusy taste. They're very high in vitamin C, potassium, and magnesium. Spruce has an incredibly unique citrus and pine flavor. It's highly underutilized as a culinary herb. The tips themselves can be eaten raw, they can be eaten as a tea, or they can be dried and powdered into a spice um, that could be added to different things. <clears throat> So when should you harvest spruce tips? Spruce trees develop their new growths in the spring and early summer. Now is about the time when you would harvest these. The tips should be harvested while they're still really soft and rubbery. After the tips begin to harden and the resin is fully developed inside of them, they're not really suitable for eating raw. They may still be used as a tea, however, they're gonna become bitter. Um, it's best to get them when they are still really soft and tender and there's not a whole bunch of resin up in the, the, um, the leaves. Different varieties of spruce tips will, uh, different varieties of spruce will produce tips that have widely varying flavors. You can taste test them a bit to make sure that the tree that you're picking it from has the flavors you want. Some can be bitter, but none are poisonous. They're all just different. Um, you never want to pick more than you plan to use, though, as these spruce tips represent the entirety of the needle growth for that year for that plant. Um, so just pick a few from each tree, uh, as opposed to you don't want to pick all of the tips off of a tree because then that plant has no growth, no needle growth for that year. So here's some spruce tip tea. Um, it's a nice way to uh, um, use spruce tips. It's very enjoyable. It's very tasty. It has like a piney flavor. Um, spruce tips with honey as a um, <clears throat> spruce tea with honey has been used for centuries in Nordic folk medicine as a cold remedy because of how high it is in vitamin C and uh, the resins in um, spruce are uh, highly bacteriostatic. They're antimicrobial. Um, they're, they're good at treating infection. Spruce okay, this is excellent. Yeah, for sure. Spruce tea is, is easily made by steeping young spruce needles in boiling water for about 10 minutes. For a holiday spice variant, add a stick of cinnamon, a couple of cloves, and some nutmeg and allspice. And um, it tastes like Christmas. Spruce tip pesto. This is a really cool way to use it as well. Just uh, spruce, garlic, pine nuts, salt and pepper and nutmeg and some crushed red pepper to a food processor and just run it until it's smooth. And then while it's running, you just add olive oil slowly until it reaches the desired consistency. Mix that in with some pasta and some Parmesan cheese. It is delicious. Spruce tip ice cream. Uh, this recipe went super viral on like foraging Instagram <laughs> and foraging TikTok a couple of years ago. Um, and it's, it's, it's a really good recipe. It's really tasty. Um, it's a great way to use that, that flavor of spruce tips. Um, it's very kind of like Christmassy and just wholesome. Um, it, this does use a ice cream maker. Um, 
but uh, there are other ways to make an ice cream that don't use an ice cream maker and you can modify this recipe for that. So this is stinging nettle. Stinging nettle is a plant that is covered in little hairs. Um, it produces an itchy and painful rash. And so great care has to be taken when harvesting, storing, and processing stinging nettle. Despite this, stinging nettles are an incredibly popular foraged pot herb in both North America and Europe. The chemical that causes the stinging nettle to sting can be very easily cooked out, just uh, you know, dipping it in boiling water is enough heat to uh, to remove the sting from stinging nettle. It's an exceptionally nutritious plant. It's an excellent source of fatty acids as well, the, those omega three fatty acids that are also in purslane, and plant based protein. Very high protein plant. It tastes like a combination of cucumber and spinach. It has like a very distinct cucumbery taste to it. So don't get stung. Stinging nettles have tiny hairs covering the leaves and stems called trichomes that act at, like hypodermic needles. And they inject the skin with histamine, causing the body to react like an allergic reaction. So you don't have to be allergic to stinging nettle to have an allergic reaction to stinging nettle because it injects you with histamine, which is the, the chemical in the body that triggers an allergic reaction. In the UK, there's an annual world nettle eating competition where people compete to see who can eat the most raw, unprocessed stinging nettles. That has nothing to do with anything. I just thought that was an interesting fact. And <laughs> blanching nettles in boiling water for two minutes removes the sting. The water should then be thrown out though, because it'll be full of those trichomes. So here is a creamy nettle soup. This is a British recipe. Um, it's, it's very much like a leek soup. Um, it's uh, a cool way to use stinging nettle. Uh, this uh, soup can either be eaten hot or cold. Um, and uh, it has a very, you know, cucumbery leek sort of taste to it. It's very creamy, very tasty, um, and very fragrant. <clears throat> All right. Next up is wild onion. Um, wild onion can be found in the mountainous regions throughout the U.S. It has a very condensed flavor. It's similar to garlic, but without the bite. It doesn't have that spice to it like garlic does. The bulbs, leaves, and flowers are all edible on wild onion. I love adding the flowers of these to salads or topping um, soups and stuff with them. So they have little floating flowers in them and they taste like onions. Really tasty. So how to harvest wild onion. Now this is where we're gonna talk about a poisonous lookalike and that is death camas. Wild onion should be harvested when the flowers are visible to prevent accidental misidentification with death camas. So here we can see wild onion here as well as down here. The flowers are spread out. They're a little bit purplish um, and they grow in this disc shape. Death camas has flowers along a spike. So they're growing up along a spike and they are a little bit yellowish. You do not want to pick the ones that have the flowers growing on a spike. You wanna pick the ones where the flowers are coming from a single point and spread out like in a disc. This is death camas, this is wild onion. Uh, wild onion can also be distinguished by death camas from its smell. So death basically just, uh pick the bouquet and not the, the latter. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and death camas doesn't smell like onion. It's, it's not an onion. It does have a little bulb at the end of it though that looks like an onion. Um, so if you pinch it a little bit with your finger and smell it, it should smell like garlic, like onion. Um, the bulb of the wild onion, also an important note for harvesting is oftentimes surprisingly deep. It, uh, you normally uh, are gonna see like here, like about halfway up, um, sticking up out of the ground. And a lot of people think that they can just kind of pull it out or try to dig it out with their finger. It's not gonna work. You're gonna break it off and then you'll lose the bulb underground. Uh, for harvesting wild onion, you really want some sort of digging tool or use your pocket knife. If you don't mind, it's gonna get dull. 
um, then uh, uh, you should have that with you if you're going to be trying to go find some wild onions. They'll start blooming soon. They're uh, early to late summer, like throughout the summer, wild onions will start to bloom. I've been seeing some people have been finding them already. So cooking with wild onion. The fibrous outside of the bowl, it peels off really easy. It's got this root fiber that surrounds it, but it peels off really, really easy. And you'll see a little white pearl under there. That is the onion bulb. Um, wild onion bulb can be used as a substitute for garlic. It has a, a much milder flavor than garlic though. Uh, the greens of wild onions can be used as a substitute for green onions or chives, but they are gonna have a stronger flavor than green onions. <clears throat> and the flowers make an excellent, excellent addition to salads and add an oniony, garlicky flavor to any dish as an edible garnish. Here's a recipe for wild onion salt. You can take I'm your excited. You can make salt? Yeah, yeah. You can take your wild onions and some sea salt, dry out the wild onions, and just throw them together in... Um, in a food processor or a coffee grinder, and uh, you make onion salt that way, and it's it's bright green, unlike the you know the the yellowish white uh, onion powder, onion salt that you get from the store. Um, it's got a really cool color to it. It's got a really unique flavor to it. It's really good for eggs, meats, sauces, soups. Um, it's a it's a fantastic spice. So the next plant we're going to talk about is milkweed. Uh, milkweed's been used for centuries for lung health. The pods are very tasty when they're fried. They're like little vegetarian chicken nuggets. And they are a crucial part of the monarch butterfly life cycle. So milkweed is the only plant that monarch butterfly larvae eat. Without milkweed, monarch caterpillars cannot develop into butterflies. Milkweed contains cardiac toxins that can be deadly to most vertebrates in high doses. Um, you don't have to worry so much about eating. You would have to eat a lot of milkweed to, um, to uh, uh, poison yourself with cardiac toxins. Um, but the larvae of the monarch butterfly eats exclusively milkweed and it condenses those toxins so that when it turns into a butterfly, uh, it's protected from predators. If a, if, a, if a predator were to eat a monarch butterfly, they'll have a heart attack and die. <clears throat> Over foraging of milkweed can severely damage local butterfly populations. It is important to be very mindful when you're foraging milkweed because again, this is the only plant that monarch butterfly caterpillars eat. So milkweed as a textile. When milkweed seed pods mature, they produce a strong, highly insulating silk. The silk of milkweed pods is grown commercially as a natural hypoallergenic filler for pillows and winter coats and can be used as an alternative to petroleum-based plastic fiber fillers. During World War II, more than 5,000 tons of milkweed was harvested in the U.S. to be used as an insulator for uniforms used by allied forces in Europe and the Miwok people of Northern California historically harvested milkweed to produce thread, rope, netting, and other cordage. As a vegetable, while milkweed has been used as a vegetable for centuries, care must be taken in preparing and it must be cooked thoroughly as milkweed is mildly toxic. You can cook out those cardiac toxins. Uh, the shoots, pods, and flowers of milkweed are edible when thoroughly cooked. The young pods are the most commonly eaten part of the plant as a vegetable. And milkweed pods should be harvested for consumption when they are very young, only about as wide as your thumb, prior to when the silk starts to develop fully. Now you don't want to start breaking open all of the pods because you're just gonna kill all of the pods that way, but the best indicator that a pod that you have picked is of the right maturity and good size is when all of the seeds are still very pale and white inside of it. It hasn't developed those fibers yet. Um, and all the seeds are just combined in this little pod inside of here and, and not like a, um, not like in the last, not like this. They don't have this fiber to them. They're all just combined together like this. That is what you want. And here's a recipe on how to use them to make vegan buffalo wings. 
uh, just gonna bread them in some panko, add a bunch of spices to it, um, and uh, and and deep uh, uh, not deep fry. You can deep fry it, but uh, bake them in this case. And then when you're done, you just coat them in hot sauce, toss them with whatever hot sauce you want, and serve them. They're very very tasty. Um, they have a texture that is similar to artichoke, like artichoke hearts. That's what I would compare it to the, the most. Um, and uh, yeah, one of my favorite, one of my favorite personal uh, things to, to forage. Um, and then my favorite thing to forage is asparagus. Um, asparagus shoots come up in the spring and early summer. They become a highly toxic berry producing bush as they mature. Um, they can be found near water sources in riparian environments, such as streams or well irrigated fields. I find a lot of these at the edges of cow, cow pastures. Wild asparagus is no different than store bought asparagus, and it can be found easily if you know what you're looking for. So, this is the asparagus life cycle. Um, the shoot forms, and this is the part that we eat is the little shoot that comes up out of the ground. As it matures, it bushes out into like a fern and sends up new shoots. <clears throat> uh, that fern will then get little low hanging yellow flowers on it that will turn into green and then red berries. Uh, the best way to find asparagus is to find the adult plants because these little shoots coming up out of the ground are very difficult to spot, incredibly difficult to spot. And so, but finding, you know, this red berried tree-like plant is much easier to do. And uh, you'll, you'll spot this and then you'll know where to go next year to find the shoots. And so you wanna mark the location of the adult plant so that the following year, you can go back to that same spot and find all the little shoots that are popping up. I had no idea they even bloomed. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So this is, um, these are some pictures of asparagus uh, as they mature. Um, so you see it comes in, it, it, it sort of spreads out into this branchy kind of plant. And then all of these little guys open up and become very fern-like. And that's where it starts to produce these red berries. At this stage of the asparagus's life cycle, it is highly toxic. You cannot eat this. Um, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a very dangerous plant <laughs> and, and people do it for some reason and they die every year. Um, Why? Because it's asparagus. And they're like, well, it's asparagus, I could eat it. But when it's at this stage, you cannot eat it. It is, you only want the shoots. Yeah, let's all get some vegan hem hemlock, why not? <laughs> so when you're hunting asparagus, this is what you're looking for. You're looking for the old plants. Um, and the best way to do this is to, at the end of the summer, find these and those red berries and stuff. Um, and then in the following spring, around April, early May, season's almost over already, you're gonna be looking for downed old asparagus plants like this that have fallen over on the ground. And at the base of those, you'll see the shoots popping up and you'll be able to harvest those shoots. You want to leave at least one of them to branch out and become this for next year because they'll produce a whole lot of berries and those berries will drop a whole lot of seeds and you'll get a lot of shoots next year. The more you leave, the more you're going to be able to harvest later on. So the next plant we're going to talk about is burdock. This was the very first plant that I learned how to forage and how to harvest. It's found nearly everywhere. It's highly invasive in America. This is yeah. This is uh, something I've seen a lot. Yeah. What was that? I, I said I've seen I've seen this one a, a lot actually, but I've never even identified it as something useful. Oh yeah, yeah. Me um, neither. It's in Italian cuisine and it's used in Japanese cuisine. Um, so in Japanese cuisine, it's called gobo and they use the roots and then the stems. Are oh used my in God. I feel so stupid now. That's <laughs> yeah, gobo. This, this is gobo. Yep. Yep. Oh, oh my God. Everywhere. Um, fun fact, uh, this is the seed pod of burdock on the, on the lower left over here. Um, and this was the inspiration for Velcro. Um, 
the, the these seeds stick to just about everything, which is how they're so invasive. And uh, they're on the noxious weed plant um, list for pretty much, I think every state has this plant on, on their noxious invasive weed list. Um, <clears throat> But these seeds stick to just about everything, and they were the inspiration for Velcro. Um, another little fun thing is if you're looking at this burdock right here on the upper right, um, you can see that a lot of little catnip is growing all around it. The, that All this right here is catnip popping up next to the burdock. So burdock root as a vegetable. Burdock root is used extensively in Japanese cuisine where it's referred to as gobo. Gobo is typically pickled in rice vinegar and dyed orange with carrot powder. Um, I'm not sure why they dye it orange. I've been asked that before. I really don't know. Um, not all of it is, but, um, but a lot of burdock is dyed orange with carrot powder. Gobo can be eaten as a side dish, um, as a salad called kimkira gobo, which is what's up here or it can be made into gobo maki, uh, which is a sushi made from gobo, rice, and seaweed. And uh, Roman cardune, this is, uh, I make this every year. This is the first wild dish that I ever learned how to make. This is a, um, a very, very old Italian Roman recipe uh, that's been made for centuries and centuries. Um, you take your burdock stems, cut them into one to two inch segments, uh, and then boil them um, until they're tender. And then you dip them in egg to and fully coat them in breadcrumbs. And then you fry that in olive oil. I like to, so uh, the way they did this recipe is with these larger stems and um, they dip them individually and it kind of looks like zucchini sticks or something. The way I do it is um, I boil them till they're really tender and then I just dump them all into breadcrumbs and I mash them together so that they're like a veggie patty. And then oh, I fry. That sounds delightful. Yeah, it's really, it's really good that way. Um, I mean, it's the same recipe either way. It's just adding a, a step. And I, I like doing it that way because they're, they're like little hush puppies or, or like little veggie patties. And um, I, I top them with uh, some lemon juice, basil, Parmesan cheese, maybe a little marinara. Um, I'll, I'll throw some marinara on them sometimes. Very good. Delightful. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next one we're going to talk about is cattails. Cattails are a reed that grows in marsh, marshy areas and along lake shores, and it's also very tasty edible. The young tender shoots can be harvested as they're coming up and they taste similar to peppery cucumber. It's the best way I could describe it. Um, also kind of a little nutty. Uh, cattail is easily identifiable by its cylindrical flower cluster called a catkin. Um, these big corn dogs. Uh, the catkins are edible in the springtime while they're still green and immature. So first off, cattail shoots. Um, this is what I normally harvest with them. This is uh, my one of my favorite edibles, really. Um, young cattail shoots have a very tender lower portion, this white lower portion that looks similar to a leek and it tastes similar to cucumber. Um, it can be eaten raw, steamed or fried and lends itself really well to stir fries. I, I add this to a lot of stir fries. Um, only the white tender part should be cooked though. Uh, similar to leek. Um, the further up you go on this plant, the more fibrous and inedible the plant becomes. <clears throat> and you can see all these little shoots coming up over here. You just grab them and, and pluck them out. And we're going to we're gonna actually watch a little video in a second uh, where, where someone goes and harvests some cattail. So here's uh, how to make cattail pickles. Um, this is a good way to store those shoots for um, for eating later throughout the year uh, because they mature really quickly. Like uh, cattails can mature in like a day. Um, so uh, getting them while they're young and pickling them or storing them in some other ways is really the best way to enjoy this plant uh, throughout the year. And so the cattail catkins, the catkins of cattail are edible when they're immature. Don't bite them. 
and green. <laughs> Me they're, want buy. Yeah, they're often covered in a yellow pollen, as the cat tail the catkin is actually a spike of tiny flowers. The cattail catkin is high in starch and is not only a good edible, but it's a very good survival food. If you're, you know, lost in the wilderness, this is a highly nutrient dense and highly starch filled um, uh, food that will keep you going and keep you alive. So we're going to talk about cattail on the cob. Another video. The cattail is one of the most useful wild plants in the world. Its edible fibrous roots are loaded with starchy carbohydrates. Its tender shoots can be eaten raw, cooked in a stir fry, or pickled. Its spike can be cooked like corn on the cob, and its pollen can be collected and eaten as an incredibly nutrient-dense food. The pollen is high in vitamins and minerals, including calcium and iron, and has four times the concentration of vitamin C as an orange. In this video, we will talk about different ways to collect and cook the cattail spike as a delicious and nutritious wild food. So here's a part of a cattail flower that most of us are used to seeing because it uh, persists on the plant for so long. This was a year old. It's been through the winter and really sees these fluffy little uh, seeds. This is great for uh, a fire starter, but for food, uh, it's no longer any good. You really have to watch the cattail uh, this mid-June right now where I am and this uh, flowers develop in a matter of days, if not hours. So you can actually see that it's close to corn almost, where um, when it's really young, it still has um, a husk on it. And if you kind of pull it away, you can see that young little cattail flower growing in here, nice and tender. Um, this is the, the fluffy part, and this is the part that has the pollen. So this is actually a good time to harvest. Uh, it's a little early, but if you're gonna do cattail corn on the cob, um, this tastes like corn, and this part tastes like corn if you boil it for a little while, and eat it right off the stem there. And this part is much more nutritious. It's full of the vitamins and minerals that are in those pollen sacs. Um, quickly, within you know just a day, it grows out of that uh, husk, and then you'll start to see the flower emerge and this one is already starting, starts at the tip to release the pollen. So this is still a very good stage for eating. This is a pretty telling um, example of just how quickly you lose your pollen. So uh, this has maybe been, this wasn't ripe yesterday and it's already releasing pollen today. You can see um, right here, that pollen is coming out. This is still, you're able to collect pollen out of this part but when it turns this light fluffy brown, you're kind of past your prime. So from here up, uh, it's better to shake out the pollen and then uh, save this part. That's still good. So here's my result um, back in the kitchen of collecting cattail flowers of about an hour of work. And these are basically the three stages of development of the cattail flower that I like to process into different types of food. The first being a uh, cattail on the cob, similar to corn on the cob. I prefer to eat it as corn on the cob or cattail on the cob when the pollen part is still um, hard, it hasn't released the pollen yet. And so if it's firm, it's not falling apart, not flaking off, both the top and the bottom part are good for boiling and eating on the cob. Very tasty and uh, a good wild food. The next stage is when the pollen flowers are starting to soften up, starting to have bulges in them and starting to release the pollen. You can boil this as cattail on the cob as well if it's early, but after a while, it just starts to flake off. This uh, brown fluffy part isn't very good most of the cattail pollen has flaked off and it's just this kind of dead flower part. So for this part, what I like to do um, is just 
take the, the part that still has cattail pollen in there, a little flaky stuff, and I just strip that off. And I'll pile that up. And what I'll use that for is it's loaded with nutrition, um, high in vitamin C, different minerals. And I'll use that as a thickener um, on different wild food recipes as a flour or a thickener in soup. Just another way to add nutrition um, to your diet from some of the wild food we collected. So all these fluffy ones in that bowl, I'm going to strip the, the cattail flour and the pollen off and collect it. You can do this in the field as well. And um, I'll probably either dry it or freeze it. And that way I can use it throughout the year and add to different recipes. It's a very effective and fast way to collect the nutritious wild food as just take off the whole flour and um, save it. The third stage of collecting wild food, and you'll see this a lot in survival books, is the pollen. This is incredibly nutritious, nutrient dense, very, very high in vitamin C, different minerals. And this represents about 40 different flowers shaking them. And it's just that pure pollen. Um, in about 40 flowers collected, a little less than half a cup. So it's not a very efficient way to collect a large amount of food, uh, but you do have this fine powder that you can add to different things and really add some uh, nutritious um, vitamins and minerals. So I will save this, and you'll see this used in different recipes later in the year uh, on some of my wild food uh, cooking videos. So now what I'm going to do is start boiling this cattail on the cob. You can see it, even some of them have a uh, husk just like corn on the cob. So I am going to throw that in boiling water for a few minutes and uh, when it's done I'm going to eat some fresh and then I'm going to vacuum pack and save the rest of it for eating later in the year. Here we go, cooking our cattail on the cob. I'm going to have to do it in batches since I have so much and the water will pretty much instantly turn a green color when you do this. Here's the cooked cattail on the cob. Um, it has a good flavor. It's a little bit like corn, not exactly like corn. But I really enjoy eating cattail on the cob and it's something my boys really enjoy too. I was surprised when I gave it to them how much they liked it. So should try cattail on the cob. It's really good. <laughs> Would you like some more? Uh, Say more, please. More. Good job. Yummy. Um, that was a cute ending to that video. So we're gonna talk about some fruits. Uh, that was uh, all of our vegetables and stuff. <clears throat> so wild plums, these are a summer fruit. They're very sour. Um, uh, this, this is, uh, these ones specifically are what's called Mexican plum. Um, they're what's common in Colorado, but there are a few different varieties throughout uh, the US. In California, Japanese plums are invasive and they're all over the place, but they you could use pretty much all of these in a very similar way. They're very similar plants. Uh, they've got these big oblong leaves like this and um, <clears throat> that helps them to be easily identified. Uh, when they first start to ripen up, they will be a yellow pinkish color like this. And then when you wanna harvest them is when they get this dusty texture on the outside. Um, and it rubs off, uh, but like this dusty texture is what you're looking for, um, for wild plums to harvest. That's when they're going to be fully ripe and, and uh, as, the, as sweet as they, they're going to be. They're a pretty sour fruit in general. Yeah, ume is not all that sweet uh, if you get good ume. Yep, yep. So what is umeboshi? Umeboshi is a centuries old superfood eaten as a staple dish and ingredient in Japan. Umeboshi is made from pickling and salting sour plums. The pickled plums are highly nutrient dense, containing many difficult to find essential minerals such as copper and manganese. They're higher in vitamin C than citrus, and umeboshi has been consumed for centuries as an immune booster. 
They're an effective digestive aid and umeboshi is often recommended for anti-inflammatory diets. So they're really good if you have- Would this be good for fibromyalgia, do you think? It could be. Um, if you if you jump in my um, my medicinal class that I teach, I have a few different um, uh, recipes in that one that are more like antispasmodic for the stomach and more. Uh, um, uh, I would like that. If yeah. you don't mind touching base with me later and just like spamming me some recipes, I, I'd really love to learn. Yeah, I can do that. No problem. <laughs> So oh, making wild plum umeboshi. Uh, you're going to take your wild plums and some fine sea salt equal to 8% of the weight of your plums. Put them in a pail of water uh, or some other kind of, or a pail uh, or some other kind of watertight container, and then you're going to soak them in water for 24 hours. Dump in water and return the plums to the container. And you're going to spread all got the salt. Him. Hey, got him. <laughs> hey, he was over there. Spray the salt over the plums and lay a clean muslin cloth over the top of the container. Then you're going to weigh down the cloth with stones or other objects that are at least the weight of the plums. Let that sit for three weeks like this. Afterwards, you'll remove the plums and strain out any of the liquid and dry the plums in the sun for three days. And there you go. You got Uliboshi. That is so easy to make. Yeah, yeah. You just leave it. <laughs> You just kind of then eight fermented foods. Mm -hmm. uh, choke cherry. This is uh, something I harvest a lot of choke cherry. They grow in really large quantities. Um, choke cherry should be cooked prior to eating it. You can't just eat it right up. You can just eat it right off the bush, but it contains um, an astringent in it that will dry out your mouth really, really, really quickly. Oh, it's um, very like tart. I, I have a choke cherry bush in my backyard. Yeah, they're really tart, but if you cook them, they don't have that, uh, they don't have that astringent property to them anymore. They, they, and they're just sweet and tasty like cherries. They make really good syrups and pies and ice cream. Um, choke cherry uh, pies were like a delicacy where I grew up and um, they, they, people would make tons and tons of them every year. Um, they grow in these bunches like this. The you'll first see these spikes of flowers. Um, and then each one of these little flowers will eventually turn into a little berry like this. Um, the bushes can be pretty large and they produce lots and lots of berries. They're also an, a very important food for birds. And so you wanna make sure that you leave some for the birds. <clears throat> so choke cherry jam. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty easy recipe to make. You're just gonna simmer your choke cherries, excuse me, in a saucepan for about half an hour and uh, while gently mashing them. Uh, strain out all the fruit pulp and the seeds, measure the juice. You'll need about four cups of the juice. Return it to the pan, add sugar and lemon juice to it and bring it to a rolling boil. You'll boil it for a half an hour, stirring it frequently to prevent scor uh, scorching and overflows. And then just put it in a jam jar and let it sit in the fridge. And uh, there you go, you got choke cherry jam. The natural pectin in the fruit will, um, will uh, uh, cause it to gel up. <clears throat> so raspberries, blackberries, and mulberries. Um, summertime fruit, they grow pretty much everywhere. You want to be careful when harvesting them because of the spines, um, and they gr the the leaves are very recognizable. They grow in these little three patterns like this. So at the at the end of a stem, three little oblong leaves are going to be popping out like this. And you can use the leaves as a tea as well. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, this is a plant you could just eat these right off of the bush. Uh, they're going to be just like the the blackberries and raspberries and mulberries that you get at a store. Um, and uh, again, crucial food source for wildlife as well. Bears, deer, birds eat this. And so you wanna, you wanna make sure you're not over harvesting these or any fruits really. Yeah, 
raspberries can sometimes not grow as frequently as blackberries, at least where I was from. Um, there would be like one raspberry bush and like six blackberries. Yeah, blackberry bushes, especially um, there is a blackberry that is called the Tibetan blackberry, I think it's called, or it's like the ne Nepalese blackberry. It is not from Nepal or Tibet. It is a, uh, it is a GMO um, blackberry that was developed in the U.S. by a horticulturist, and then it became highly invasive in California and has now spread to much of the U.S., um, so a lot of the blackberry bushes that people see, it's actually an invasive plant um, that outcompetes local uh, fruiting plants like wild raspberries or mulberries. And so a lot of times the reason you see so many more blackberry bushes than you, de than you do raspberry bushes is because it's this invasive plant that was developed in a laboratory and then got out basically. Uh, so yeah, June berries. June berries are a mid to late summer harvest. They're very similar to blueberries, but they're not very sweet. They're not super sweet berries. They're very um, kind of mealy texture and they're very high in star starches. Um, I actually really love these personally, and they're really good for acid reflux because they contain um, a lot of uh, um, <clears throat> like a mild base that, uh, will um, settle the stomach acids if you overproduce stomach acid like I do. And um, while they're called June berries, I never seem to see them mature in June. Um, they, uh, they're they usually kind of like a July, August plant for me. Um, and uh, they'll start off um, forming these little pink, well, they'll start off with these little white uh, greenish berries that will eventually turn pink. And then when they're good for harvest is when they get this deep purple color. And then like a plum, they'll get this dusty texture on the outside of them, just like a blueberry too. They get this kind of like dusty sort of sheen on the outside of them. And that's when they're ready. So, yep. Um, so talking about uh, June berries and choke cherries and stuff, um, pemmican is a traditional staple food of many First Nations tribes, especially the nomadic tribes of the plains that needed a nutrient dense high energy food that kept well to take with them. Pemmican was also um, adopted by, uh, you know, frontiersmen and trappers and various colonizers um, and became a staple food for explorers. Um, throughout the 1800s. Pemmican is made from dried meat, usually elk, bison, deer, or caribou, and dried fruit, usually June berries or choke cherries. It was adopted quickly by fur traders in the early days of colonization in America and became the food of explorers such as Lewis and Clark, Captain Robert Bartlett, and Ernest Shackleton. And so I have actually two quick videos on pemmican because I don't know why he split this into two videos, but he did. It could really could have been one. Uh, this is um, a another great YouTube channel that talks a lot about wild foraged foods, um, specifically on historical foods. This is pemmican. It's food from the 18th and 19th centuries originally made by indigenous peoples of North America and then used by voyagers, uh, frontiersmen, and explorers alike. It is a highly condensed, uh, nutritious form of food. It's, in fact, the ultimate survival food. Over the next few episodes, we're going to talk about exactly what pemmican is, how it was made historically, how you can make it in your modern kitchen, and also how we can cook with it. Uh, whether it's at home, uh, at an historical event, or in your next survival outing. I want to thank you for joining us today on 18th Century Cooking with James Townsend and Son. Pemmican was traditionally made of just two or three ingredients, dried meat, animal fats, and dried berries. At the height of its production, from the late 18th century to the mid-19th century, the vast majority of it was made with bison, 
although at times deer, moose, and elk were used, depending upon availability. A group of people called the Medus were most famous for their pemmican. The Medus were a unique people group with their own cultural identity. They originated from the descendants of French voyageurs and their Native American wives. They were responsible for most of the pemmican that was sold and traded throughout the northern regions of North America. The Medus people developed an entire societal structure based upon the buffalo hunt. Uh, while the men hunted buffalo, the women processed them. Period accounts say that a skilled Medus woman could dismantle up to 10 buffalo carcasses a day, leaving very little behind for the wild animals to scavenge. Once the usable portions of the animal were harvested, they'd be processed over the next few days. The meat was cut into thin strips and laid out on wooden racks to dry near the fire and in the heat of the sun. The skins were stripped of their hair and sewn into rawhide bags that would be used to store the pemmican. Suet was melted and refined into tallow, and the bones were cracked and the delicate marrow extracted. A single bison cow, when processed properly, would produce about 250 pounds of raw meat, or about 50 pounds of dried meat. This same cow would produce also about 50 pounds of rendered tallow. The dried meat was pulverized and placed into rawhide bags. Sometimes dried berries were mixed in. Then the liquid suet was poured in over the top and mixed in well. Then the bag was sewn shut. Pemmican produced and stored in this fashion would last a long time. Some reports suggest 10, 20, even 30 years. It was the ultimate survival food. In our next episode, we'll show you how you can make this authentic pemmican at home. If you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also... In our last episode, I showed you how pemmican, the ultimate survival food, was made in the 18th and 19th centuries. Today, I'm going to show you how you can easily make it in a modern kitchen so that you can use it at your next historical reenactment, your uh, survival outing, or even your next camping trip. Thanks for joining us today on 18th Century Cooking with James Townsend and Son. Large quantities of pemmican was made with bison. Today we're using beef. If you have access to bison or, or perhaps uh, venison, you may use that instead. Bison was the obvious selection for large-scale pemmican production. Now today, the wild bison herd is very small, but during the late 1700s, great buffalo herds extended from just west of the Appalachian Mountains all the way to the Rockies, and as far south as what is now Mexico, all the way north to Arctic Canada. Many native peoples of America depended on pemmican for their survival. It kept well, and it was an excellent food source, especially during hard winter months. Pemmican was also an important food source for many voyagers and fur traders. The demand for pemmican put a tremendous strain on the buffalo herd. There is one particular group of people called the Métis. They were descendants of early voyageurs and their native wives. The Métis produced and supplied most of the pemmican. They conducted two hunts per year, one in the spring and one in the fall. A single Métis hunting party could have up to a thousand ox-drawn carts in tow and could return from the hunt with up to a million pounds of pemmican and dried meat. And there were multiple Métis hunting parties. About half of the pemmican produced by the Métis was kept and used by them to get them through the hard winter. The remaining pemmican was sold to the Hudson Bay Company or its competitor, the Northwest Company. The pemmican sold to these companies would provision vast crews of voyageurs that used to transport their goods. It was also sold to other backwoodsmen and to outlying military posts. Competition between these two companies was fierce, so fierce that battles broke out between the employees of these companies. These battles became known as the Pemmican War. The British government eventually had to step in and settle the matter by forcing a merger between the two companies. Now back to our meat. I'm slicing this meat very thinly. I'm going to put this in my modern oven, preheated to the lowest temperature possible. You can use a dehydrator too if you wish, 
If you do, you ought to bake your meat strips first in your oven at 200 degrees for about a half an hour, and then you can place them into the dehydrator to dry up. The process will take between 10 and 12 hours. Your meat should be completely dry and brittle when it's done. For every pound of raw beef, you should end up with about a quarter pound of dried meat. Now, some of you are probably thinking, John, why don't you just use beef jerky instead of dried beef in this recipe? Well, typically, jerky is very highly salted, it's highly spiced, and it also contains nitrates. These all add up to a very concentrated flavor, which isn't good in pemmican. The other problem is it's cut with the grain instead of against the grain, so it's very difficult to break up into our powder. Once our meat is dry and brittle, I'm going to melt in a saucepan an equal amount by weight of suet. Today I'm using a Taurus suet in this recipe, uh, which is uh, available online on our website. Now you can render your own tallow from raw suet, but make sure to watch our previous episode on suet. That'll give you instructions on how to do that. Now I'm gonna take my dried meat and I could use a mortar and pestle or even easier, I could use my food processor at home. Regardless, I wanna end up with a coarse powder. I've got about eight ounces of dried beef here. I'm going to mix in about an ounce of dried berries. Those are optional, along with eight ounces of melted suet. A common version in the time period had ground up choke berries. These you can find online. If you add dried berries to your pemmican, it will not keep as well. This version is called seed pemmican. Let's see what this pemmican tastes like raw. You know, there's not a lot of flavor right up front. After you chew it for a while, you get a nice little beefy flavor. The texture might turn off some, but hey, if you're tired and you're hungry, this will keep you going. And here it is, authentic pemmican. In our next episode, I'll show you how to prepare easy, delicious dishes with this wonderful mixture. If you haven't already. So yeah, like Jan said, um, the uh, uh, pemmican you can use as a food on its own, or um, you can use it as an ingredient in other recipes. That was a little bit about. This is pemmican. In our it's last food from the eight there we go, prickly pear. <laughs> uh, this is a common arid fruit that's found throughout the U.S. So this is a this is a fruit that you would find in a lot of desert areas and arid areas. You can find this in Colorado, um, but uh, I actually usually take a trip once a year to New Mexico where I forage for prickly pear. The young pads can be eaten as a vegetable, um, but care must be taken while harvesting this plant because as you can see, it's a cactus, it's covered in spines. <clears throat> so uh, the prickly pear was an important food source and crop of much cultural value to the Nahuatl people of South and Central America. And it's still called by its Nahuatl name in Mexico, Nopal. Nahuatl tribes include the Aztecs, Inca, and Olmec peoples. The Nahua were exemplary horticulturists, and we owe many of our favorite crops today to the Nahua, such as avocados, tomatoes, chocolate, and chilies. Prickly pears were introduced to Europe in the 1500s and are now spread worldwide along with other New World foods that were grown and domesticated by the Nahua. So how to eat prickly pears. Um, prickly pears are full of tiny little seeds, um, sort of like a dragon fruit, uh, but the seeds are really hard and um, they're not really like, you, you can't eat them very easily. Uh, so a lot of how people eat uh, nopal fruit or, or, um, or prickly pears is by straining the juice out. And this is how I do it as well. So you can remove the fruit from the pad with like tongs or really heavy gloves. And then with a knife and a fork, carefully remove the skin of the fruit as it's covered in tons and tons of little spines. It's not the big spines that you have to worry about. The tiny little hair-like spines on there are designed in, are, are, 
um, have structures on them that uh, they will continuously dig into the skin over time and make like a rash. Uh, you chunk up the fruit and run it through a food processor or a food mill, and then strain the pulpy liquid through a colander or a fine sieve to remove the seeds. You can then add this juice to lemonade, margaritas, salsas, put it on top of salads as a dressing. Uh, I, I make a simple syrup out of it, add it to cocktails. It's really good. It's a really uh, tasty um, uh, fruit and it tastes uh, kind of like strawberry, I would compare it to. It's not pear-like at all. It's almost more of like a berry taste to it. So the next one is gooseberries. These are a type of currant. Um, there's lots of different types of currant that grow in the US. Uh, they all have this leaf structure to them like this. They have this kind of clovery leaf structure where they have these little lobes and then three big lobes. Um, that's the easiest way to identify different kinds of currants. All currants are edible. Um, they're really great for jams. They have a lot of pectin in them. Uh, gooseberries are very sour and sweet tasting. Um, and then wax currants, these are another type of current you can see here, they still have this lobe texture um, where there's like lots of little lobes and then three big lobes, one, two, and three, one, two, and three over here. Wax currants are very mild tasting. They have a waxy flesh to them um, and they have like a, a, a very mildly sweet apple flavor. They're high in simple starches and they're very popular with birds. This is a uh, a, a plant that lots and lots of birds go to because they're so high in, in simple starches that are easily converted to energy. <clears throat> and so here's how you can make some different wild fruit syrups. Syrups is one of the best ways to enjoy wild fruits and um, a, a really nice way to store these fruits for a long period of time and, and, and still have you know that flavor and everything. Um, and it's very easy to make. It's just a simple mix of water, some sort of sweetener and fruit. You'll crush the flesh of the fruit, add it to a pot, filling it up with just enough water to cover the fruits, bring it to nearly boiling, steaming hot while stirring it constantly. Let it steep for about 15 minutes like it was a tea and then strain out the fruit water and mark the amount of liquid that you have uh, used. You wanna return the liquid to the pot and then add an equal amount of sugar. Um, bring that liquid back up to heat and stir it until all the sugar is dissolved. And then you can just bottle it or put it into jars. Um, you can also try substituting honey or brown sugar for different flavor profiles. Or if you want to make a, like a diabetic friendly one, you could use monk fruit sugar or, um, uh, you know, any other kind of, of sweetener that you use. And our last segment, it's a kind of a brief look at some common wild mushrooms. All of the mushrooms that I'm gonna show you guys are ones that don't have uh, any poisonous lookalikes. Um, you wanna be very careful when you're harvesting mushrooms. Uh, just because there are a lot of different funguses that look really similar to each other and, and, and really uh, can be really dangerous. Uh, so you want to be clear in your identification when you're harvesting mushrooms, but these ones are pretty noticeable. First one is oyster mushrooms. I get these ones a lot. Uh, they are blooming right now. So if you go out to uh, riparian areas like uh, stream beds, uh, lakes, um, especially where there's a lot of cottonwood trees growing, um, you could find these guys growing off of fallen trees. Uh, and they grow in really, really large clusters and they appear in about a day, even as much as like, they'll, they'll change within hours. Um, they'll, they grow really, really quickly, they release their spores and then they die really, really quickly. Um, you have maybe like a two day grace period after a rain to go and find these. And so after it rains, uh, you can go and go by a lake bed and stuff and, and, and find a, a whole lot of these. They also will, um, they will uh, uh, fruit from the same mycelium uh, several times. So you can go and harvest a bunch of these. And then the next time it rains, go back to the same spot and they'll sprout again from the same spot. Next one is chanterelles. 
They are these trumpet looking yellow mushrooms. These are a prized edible. Lots of people really, really like these. They're less common in um, Colorado as they are in uh, the um, Midwest uh, up to the Appalachian Mountains. But these um, uh, grow at the edges of forests out of the leaf litter at the bottom of the forests, especially deciduous forests. Um, so any places where trees lose their leaves every winter, um, you can go and find these growing out of the leaf litter, usually on the edges of the forest, and they grow in very large bunches. Next one is king bolets. Um, these grow in mountainous regions at high elevations. They're also called porcini mushrooms, and they're used a lot in Italian cuisine. Uh, these are a very large mushroom. Some of these caps can get like as big as your head. They're huge. Sorry, there's a, I don't know if you can hear the fire truck going by. Um, the, these get really, really big. They have a porous underside. So the underside of them does not have gills. Like the other two mushrooms that we looked at, you can see these guys have these gills. King bolets have pores underneath. Um, and uh, they have a distinct almondy aroma to them. Um, and uh, you can um, find these on the edges of forests in high alpine areas um, that are coniferous. So you find these growing out of the needles at the bottom of the forest floor, usually on the edges of the forest. Next one is morels. Now these do have a toxic lookalike, but it is not very much of a lookalike in my opinion. In the bottom right-hand corner here, we can see a black morel, a blonde morel, and a false morel. So this is a false morel at the end here. This is not a morel mushroom. You see it does not have this lattice uh, structure that the, um, that the other morels have. And there are two varieties of morels. There's a black morel and a blonde morel. They fruit at different times. The blonde morels um, would be the ones fruiting in the early summer and in the spring. These are fruiting now. And then the black morels will start appearing more in mid to late summer. Uh, the interesting thing about morels and how to find them pretty easily is that they really like forest fire. So if you go where there was a forest fire last year, you can find morels growing out of the soot. <clears throat> and that's the whole class, guys. That is the whole presentation. Any questions or anything, comments? Awesome. Well, uh, Alex was recording this whole thing. Um, Tav and Daniel, I will, uh, I'll shoot you a DM with the link to this presentation on it. Alex, I'll shoot you the link too, because I don't think you have this one. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, see you guys next week. And if people want to hang around and stay for the African spiritualities class, please feel free. <laughs> Yeah, so divination does a whole lot of classes uh, on all sorts of different subjects. Um, really cool group. I'll, I'll